So please join me in welcoming Andy. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. There are three things a farmer will never do. He'll never spray paint the side of a shop with graffiti. He'll never burn money. And he'll never admit that he's wrong. Or she will never admit that she's wrong. In the next hour, I plan to shatter all these three ideas. More importantly, I hope to give you an idea within the next 15 minutes that will result in an extra $100,000 in profitability before the end of the year for your operation. Anybody can apply it. But more importantly, I hope to give you a different philosophy to farm management that dramatically improves the probability of your family still farming in 2040. But who am I to say that? Um, everybody has a defining moment in their lives. For mine, it was my parents' divorce. You see, uh, everybody has vices, I guess. Um, usually when divorces happen, it's because um, of adultery or alcoholism. My dad was addicted to farming. <laughs> and, and he, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, if you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? And see, the thing is, my mother, she told my father, do not buy any more farming equipment until you sat down with your son and written a business plan. And my dad, just despite her, he went off to an auction sale and uh, he bought a manure spreader. And he came home with that manure spreader. <laughs> and I guess you could say the fit hit the shin. <laughs> and uh, w what I've been doing ever since is turning crappy situations around. I started off by helping my friends in Western Ontario um, I'm originally from Ontario, Canada, and I uh, started off helping my friends in Western Ontario while I was milking another man's cows. In the last 12 years, I've been turning around the most dire situations across North America. Uh, this is all I've been doing for 12 years, um, either related to farm debt or farm succession issues. And it all comes down to how families make decisions together. And my whole purpose in life is to get everybody from button heads and pulling the farm in different directions, to be able to get families to be able to sit down, make good decisions, and get everybody pulling the same direction. But that's enough about me. I, I want to get an idea, who am I speaking to today? I mean, how many beef farmers do we have here today? Okay, we've got a couple beef farmers. How many, uh, how many hog producers do we have here? We've got a ho couple hog producers. How many dairy farmers do we have? Quite a few dairy farmers. Um, how many guys here milk water buffalo? Am I the only one? Um, for the first five years that I started doing this, I milked another man's cows. Henry Crosscamp had 400 dairy cows, Holstein, Holstein dairy cows. He has a biodigester, he's got a poultry operation, he cash crops 1,200 acres. And then he read in a farm magazine about these damn water buffalo. And so he took 100 water buffalo from the swamps of Florida and imported them into Canada. And then they, they thought it would be as simple as putting the milkers on. Well, as it turns out, water buffalo kick. <laughs> and it was more like a rodeo for a, couple, uh, for a year. The first six months, uh, they had two guys break their arms. And uh, I was only one crazy enough and patient enough to be able to milk these damn water buffalo. So I'd milk these water buffalo. There was seven, we had a double six parlor, like old, old school, big milk, ju uh, milk jars, double six parlor. And I'd spend morning and night, and for the first five years I was doing this, in between during the day, I'd go help my friends saving family farms. And then I started writing for a few farm magazines and I got started getting phone calls from all over North America and it got to the point that I couldn't milk water buffalo anymore. It's my form of yoga. But, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's how we got this whole thing started. But the thing is, how many guys here are cash croppers? How many guys here make half their income off of cash cropping? Right? So the question is, I hope we're back to the days of $7 corn anytime soon. Right? How many people hope for those days? But my question is, how many guys here are concerned that the next five years we might not see $7 corn, it might actually be closer to $7 beans? How many people here are worried about the future of agriculture as much as I am? Okay, 
My question is, how low could beans go? Don't speak all at once, lads. Okay, how low could the price of beans go? Anybody? Have? But, but how, what's the price of beans going to be on the market? That isn't dependent on you, it's dependent on the market, right? No, nobody's got a crystal ball of the future, but my question is how, how low do you guys think it's going to go as far as beans prices? 690. 690? How low, who, who else, how many people think it could get low as, as at some point hit 690? Right? That's pretty scary, isn't it? You guys want to talk about farm succession planning? You know, what I, what I think you guys should do, my first piece of advice is pretty simple. On the drive home tonight, you talk to your business partners in the truck, and you talk about how low could the price of beans go. Or if you're a dairy farmer, how low could milk prices go? Right? Or whatever commodity it is that you produce. And if one of your partners is not here today, you call them up or her up and you get them on the phone, on the speaker phone, and even if you have to sit at the end of the laneway for 20 minutes, you guys come to the conclusion as to how low prices could go. And then when you get home, you leave the truck on, park in front of the shop. You guys got that in your head? Park in front of the shop, leave the lights on, go in the shop, and get the ugliest freaking spray paint you can find and put that on the side of the shop door. If you can get your cost production to this number over the next three years, succession plan is going to go easy because everybody's confident the farm can survive anything. If you can get your co lowest cost of production uh, your break-even point, the, lo uh, the lowest that you think the markets will go, succession planning will be easy. For one, you know you, you're bulletproof against anything. You know, no matter how low prices are going to go, you know you can, if anything, if it's a $6.91, you're making a penny. If it's six, a $7, you're making 10 cents, right? You're only going to make more money, right? More importantly, if you are able to drive your cost production down to that number, for most of you guys in this room, that's at least 25% lower than what your cost of production is today. And if you're able to drive your cost of production down by 25%, that's pretty remarkable. But believe me, it's part of the reason is because your son and daughter have been part of the management decisions over the next three years to be able to help you do that. And through that, play, uh, through that process, you know with confidence you got a successor that can do anything. That makes sense? That might, how many people would, we're missing something here though. You know what we're missing on this, on this door, on the shop door? It's, and, and, happy. Oops, sorry about there. I, I apologize to comp here. I think it just damaged the hotel's materials. But anyways, and happy. So the thing about that is that I've been on a lot of family farms where they're making money, hand over fist, but nobody's happy. And that's, I mean, you get depression, you get divorce. That's when the, the train goes off the tracks. So if you've got a situation where er, your farm is making money no matter what, you're, you're able to break even the worst case scenario, and everybody's going home happy every day. And by going home happy, I'm not just talking about you going home happy. I'm talking about your sister-in-law going home happy. I'm talking about your mom, your dad, your part, all your partners. Everybody, if everybody's going home happy most of the days, I mean, we're always going to get those days where we get flat tires, right? But if you can make a purpose in your culture to turn things around so most days everybody's going home happy, you got a farm that's going to be bulletproof against anything. Okay, today, how many, how many people think this is, sounds like an ideal situation? If you had a farm where this actually was, became a reality, that'd be a pretty good goal to strive for. How many people would agree with that, that? The key thing is, it seems pretty fictitious, right? Let me show you in the next hour how to turn this dream into reality. 
But the first thing we've got to talk about is what's the reality behind the barn. And before I do that, before I get talking about the reality behind the barn, what's the biggest change we've had in technology in farming over the past 50 years? Don't all speak at once, lads. What's computers? computers? Computers, I was never good for handwriting when I was a kid, so you have to forgive me. <laughs> okay, so it's technology. Computers, what, automize, auto, automization. What, what else we got here? Sorry? Cell phones? What else we got? Hybrids? I heard GPS. I mean, we could go on here. But, and I think you guys are all right. But let me give you a different perspective. I believe the biggest change in technology we've had in farming in the last 50 years that nobody's recognized is the fact that there's fewer farmers dropping dead of heart attacks in their 60s than back in the 1960s. Modern health sciences is a game changer. And we never thought about how that impacts farm management. Now, for the purpose of today, I'm not going to talk about Viagra. I mean, that's a whole different presentation. <laughs> but what I am going to say is that back in the 60s, when dad was 60, he would retire because his hips were shot. Nowadays, when dad's 60, what happens? He goes and gets hip replacement, and he's farming to his 80s or 90s, right? And there's guys that are in their 80s. How many guys know, know somebody in their 80s that can outwork any teenager, right? It's pretty awesome, isn't it? See, the thing is, and I, if you want to farm to the year you die, I'm all about making that happen. But the problem we have is back in the 60s, there, there'd be one generation farming at a time. There might be three generations living on the farm, but there'd really only be one person making decisions. But now we've got three generations farming together. We got everybody butting heads and pulling the farm in different directions, and you just get nowhere fast. And the problem is, you know, have you ever heard the term, too many chiefs, not enough Indians? I know we're talking about the neighbors, not your own situation on your farm, right? But that's happening on way too many times. And the truth that nobody's recognized when it comes to succession planning is this stuff is expensive. And if you want to be able to produce beans for this price, you need this technology, don't you? There is just no getting around it. You need this technology in order to have the competitive edge, be able to produce beans for this price or whatever commodity you have, right? But the problem we have, we have this mindset that every 22 years or every 29 years, you gotta split up the family capital between siblings because people can't work together. And the truth is, there has never been a generation we're farming, you know, these hippies in California, they say that the family farm is dead. There has never been a generation where the family farm is more relevant. And the truth is, if you want to be farming, regardless of what age you are today, if you want to be farming 20 years down the road, you've got to turn working with family from weakness into strength. Amen? Amen. And so, the conundrum that I noticed with my own family, when I, that's my boy speaking, by the way. That's my boy, Huckleberry. <laughs> Anyways, the thing is that when I came home to farm with my dad, my mother showed me the farm financials the day I left for college. And she says, you got five years to fix these numbers or else I'm leaving your dad. So no, she, 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 I might be paid as a motivational speaker. She's one heck of a motivational speaker, believe me. But the thing is, I came home and I thought it was as simple as transferring the ideas that I learned I went down to Australia, came back with 120 pounds in textbooks. I went to 14 states, interviewed the top farm managers. I spent, I had my own office at the University Library, came back with five Tupperware containers full of information and, and all this research. I thought it was gonna be as simple as transferring these ideas on the farm. The first year I came home, we had a big fight at Christmas. We had my fields, dad's fields. My Uncle Claude made the comment, your son's crop look better than yours. He's going to make more money off his acres than yours. Two weeks later, 
Crops plowed under. Nobody could understand why my dad plowed down my crops. Right? There was no reason for it. For a long time, I was sitting there milking these damn water buffalo, and they kick. <laughs> Wondering, what did I do wrong? Why would a man who was about to lose the farm and about to lose his family be so abrasive to any suggestions for change? And it, it took me a while. You know, believe it or not, when you live in a rural community and your parents get divorced over a fight over a manure spreader, you suddenly get to be that guy that all your friends call about 11 o'clock at, at night after they've had a few whiskeys into them and they had a bad day at farming with their dad. With their dad. And all I could do is listen. And after a couple of years and quite a few beers, I came to the realization of this, is that when young lads come home from agriculture college, they got tons of ideas as to how to improve the operation. Now, usually, the parents do not plow their son's crops down. Usually, the first couple ideas the parents will go out and do, even if it doesn't make sense, because they don't want to say no to their sons or daughters. They, want to bend, they are bending over backwards to do whatever it takes to get their kids into, interested in farming and be able to take over the farm. I was so jealous of my friends. Their parents were so supportive. And, but the thing is, at some point in time, these kids' ideas start to be anticipated as a criticism of past management decisions. Maybe it's on idea number 11, maybe it's idea number 111, maybe idea number 311. But at some point, here the parents have spent their entire lives to give the farm to the kids on a silver platter. And the kids are being disrespectful and making criticism of past management decisions. It's like looking a gift horse in the mouth, isn't it? And suddenly it's feeling like you've taken that silver tray that you're, the, ki the parents are giving the, the kids the, the farm on and trampling on it. And soon, at some point in time, the, the son or daughter comes up to the, to the father and dad's in the yard and instead of having open, eyed, open arms and open to any suggestions for change. Dad's got his arms crossed. And maybe at the conscious, but mostly at the subconscious level, he's looking for reasons to say no. And too often, he's just plain saying no and not explaining why it's a dumb idea. Or just plain saying it's a dumb idea. Or the son all of a sudden hears nothing but criticism from the father. And here the son feels really hurt and rejected when the father says no to his dreams. Or the daughter says no to her dreams. And suddenly, if, da dad says, if the son says black, the dad says white. But then soon, shortly after, if the dad says black, the son says white. I know we're talking about the neighbors, not your own operations, right? But suddenly, we got a situation where it's more important to be right than for things to be right. And as a result, things are just plain wrong. And this is what I've been focused on the last basically 20 years, is how do you get everybody from button heads and pulling the farm in different directions to being able to sit down and make decisions and pull in the same direction. And, and I've created a niche within a niche. To my knowledge, there's nobody doing what I do. And it's pretty hard to explain. I don't even have a job title, really. I, I really appreciate you guys telling me what it is I do. I guess the best way I could say it is that I chair family business meetings. And what I do is I meet with family, families once a week, and that is what we call a power hour. And we do it all over the internet, and it's so simple. I send you an email, you click on the email, boom, I'm on the computer screen just like, like I'm talking to you across the table. And you put that computer at the end of the kitchen table, it's just like I'm sitting at the end of the, 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 the table. And it's a time and place, we solve problems, and we anticipate problems, so the rest of the week, working with family, there ain't no problems. Okay? And today I'm going to talk about two simple ideas that you can actually do yourselves without me involved. And because two things for my agenda are, what's one way to improve how you guys work together? We do that every week. The second question I ask is, what's one way to improve farm profit? But if I'm going to give you two of my best ideas, it's going to cost you money. So 
Everybody pull out your wallets. Literally from your, pull out your wallets. Okay. Somebody, everybody pull out your wallets. Right, I want to see you guys pull out your wallet. I mean, it's going to cost you money, I tell you. Everybody pull out your wallets. You can put $100 in the air. I'm not joking either. Everybody pull out your wallets. You can put $100 in the air if you want, but I'd suggest putting a dollar if you got one. Okay, put your money in the, in, up in the air. Okay, everybody. I'm going to pick on you guys. So the thing is, when I, okay, I'm going to put your, okay, so when I go to, I mean, as part of the agenda, I have, I have one simple thing. What's one way to improve farm profit by $3,000 without spending $1,000? Okay, so every week, everybody's got to come to the table with one idea to improve farm profit by uh, uh, $3,000 without spending 1000 bucks. So small little ideas. And like, for instance, last week we had a guy in um, Ohio and uh, he sat, he came to the table, he said, we've been, uh, they have farmed 3,000 acres, they have a few trucks on the road, and they said, well, the local tire shop's going out of business. Why don't we go and buy the tire changer from them for 600 bucks? They got it for 700 bucks, right? Simple idea, they're gonna make 3,000 bucks easy off that. Another, another farmer in Idaho, they farm 3,000 acres under, under, under center pivot. The dad says, well, why don't we, uh, why don't we turn off the electricity to our, our irrigators? We're, we're wasting a lot of water by having it going seven days a week. We sat down, we crunched the numbers. That was a $20,000 savings, maybe $50,000. We'll have to see it at the end of the year. There's, little, there's money slipping between the cracks. Does anybody know? Uh, well, think about the neighbors. Can you think about the neighbors and, and money that slips between the cracks in every operation because partners never sat down once to talk about ideas? Okay. What, what's one idea for your operation to improve farm profit? Like what would be one idea for, or you can think about the neighbors. Sorry, neighbor. here I'm picking on Jacob. <laughs> what's one idea that would improve farm profit by 3,000 bucks without spending 1,000 bucks? Well, I don't know, 1,000 bucks? Okay, I'm gonna come back to you in a second. You're gonna, I'm gonna pick on you, good. Right. So Mason, you got an idea? Simple maintenance. Simple maintenance, okay. Chuck, what's, a, what's one? Cut down on refusal to feed. Perfect, right? Ro um, okay, R Robert, what do you got? So, so he said ref uh, cut down on refusals of feed, right? And that's, that's a good one, right? What do you got, Robert? TMRs, being going to add more feed. Uh, add more feed to the TMR, yeah. So Jacob, it, it's fine for you to, um, it's fine for you not to have an idea the first week, right, that I come to your farm. But if on the second week, if you don't have an idea, I'm going to burn it. <laughs> and next week I come back, it's going to be $5. The week after that, it's going to be $10, and it's going to be $100 eventually. And I guarantee you by the time we get to uh, $20, your, that idea that you had in the shower, or that idea that you had when you're plowing on Wednesday afternoon, you're going to write it down, you're going to Google it a little bit, you're going to make a few phone calls, you're going to come to the meeting prepared. And the thing is that if, what that does is, is three, uh, what that does is obviously it makes, if you have somebody, if you have every, a time and place every week, that makes a lot of money. We'll talk about that in a second. But what we don't understand is, you want to talk about chauvinism? I could speak up for an hour about how to get women in agriculture. My wife, she quit, which, she quit farming to come with me to Iowa because she really believes that this is the way to get women in agriculture. If you have a time and place to sit down and exchange ideas, and for those ideas be looked upon by merit, not by who's saying them, and you sit down and weigh the decisions, that's how women get into agriculture without any barriers to sh of chauvinism. But more importantly, you've got a situation where you've got uh, um, a successor and he, the thing is that either the successor is going to come to the table with a new idea and it's going to result in farm profitability, the farm making more money, or it's going to result in it being a dumb idea. And that's okay. The key thing is that instead of saying it's a dumb idea, we weigh the pros and cons of the idea. And through that process, you tr tr 
teach wisdom and you explain why we've done things the way we've done in the past. Any fool can give his son a tractor. Very few farmers are successful in teaching their kids how to make that tractor pay. And I really think that that's a first important step before we start talking about, uh, trans uh, before we start talking about transferring assets is first of all, transferring wisdom for a year and making sure that it's done and done well. And so the thing is with, um, what we do is, what we, what the process is we brainstorm ideas, we listen to each other's ideas, and that dynamic where um, you have dad saying no to ideas just goes away. The whole egos goes away. And what we have is a situation where we listen to each other's ideas. Because you're more likely to listen to another partner's ideas if you're about to mention your idea in about two minutes. Right? Gets rid of that whole egos, power struggle, it's gone within six months, if not six weeks. But more importantly, you know, for farm debt, I mean, what I do, and this is really important, guys, is that when it comes to burning money, it's critical to do or to have some sort of financial penalty. I found when I started doing this that 80% of the ideas never got implemented. If you have a time and place once a week where you're brainstorming ideas and you say you're going to get some, and then you break down, you make a decision as a family, Specify when is it going to get done and who's going to do it and how. And then put it in the meeting minutes, put it on the calendar. Uh, six weeks from today, Joe's going to make this phone call. He's going to do this, this, this. And then if he doesn't come to that meeting with that done, make him burn $5. Believe me, it will change the rate of imp actual implementation. And the simple math on this is, is pretty simple. If you've got three partners and you're sitting down once a week, and you, let's say two out of three ideas are good. That's going to result in two a week. Let's just say there's a thousand dollar improvement. Just be conservative. That's two thousand dollars each week, right? Fifty weeks, that's a hundred thousand dollars, just like that. The average farm that uses this method, as long as you're a stickler with a financial penalty, is about five hundred thousand dollar improvement in profitability by the end of the year. And on the average, you know, average three to five million dollar farm, that's easy to find. There's mice slipping between the cracks anywhere. Any fool can go build a barn, but it's a matter of getting the little things right in order to be able to make that barn pay, right? And this is the way you do it. But more importantly, what I found is I've used this for farm debt turnarounds. A lot of farm debt turnarounds, actually. And so I'll give you a, out of brothers in, in Wisconsin, this is two years ago when milk prices were low. They were in big trouble. And they had 1,500 cow dairy. And they had a financial guru come in. He was 400 bucks an hour. And he sat down, made some recommendations to them. And, uh, you know, they were looking at this report in the accountant's office. And they got into a fight within 20 minutes between the two brothers as to whether dog food was a personal or business expense. Dog food, right? It's the silly things that causes, when, you, when extension agents or academics, they think it's gonna be a, a challenge of just sitting down and crunching the numbers. It's a matter of getting the partners to actually be able to make decisions together, and more importantly, follow through on the decisions. Those are the barriers, that's what causes farms to fail, right? And, and we get so wrapped up in little things, we lose uh, focus on what matters. So if you, uh, what I did with this farm, they came to me and they, they needed to cut about $5 million in expenses or the, they had to sell some real estate, do, do some pretty major uh, changes to their operation in order to survive. And uh, I said, no, the first, the first three, three months, we're not gonna make one decision that costs more than $1,000. And we saved about $100,000 through that process. We, they, they came out to the table with really good ideas. But the more important thing is that they actually learn how to be able to make decisions together. And all the garbage that happened over the last 30 years, we got rid of all that first. And then we took the cap off one afternoon and within three hours, we were able to sque squeeze out four million bucks. And we were able to squeeze out another million bucks before the end of the year. And I've done this numerous times. If you can, if you can improve, it, when you think about it, anything you can do to improve the quality of decision making on your farm is going to dramatically improve profitability, 
but it's also going to get rid of all that BS of working with family. And farming with family becomes fun again. How many people here are going to do succession planning in the next 10 years? Okay. I have a cousin, Margaret, and she's a nice girl. But she's got an eight-year-old son, and she, she sit, sits him down at Christmas dinner. And the kids never sat down at the kitchen table before, right? And she wonders every year, why does this kid, her angel have, yeah, there's my angel. <laughs> why does this angel uh, throw a temper tantrum, right? Why, he's such, such a good kid, why is he throwing a temper tantrum at Christmas? The kid's never sat down at the kitchen table before in his life, right? He eats off a coffee table half the time, right? They, they eat in the living room and they graze. Does anybody have cousins like this, right? Stupid, right? <coughs> Huck back there who's crying like a fiend. Anyways, he's, uh, he's, I know that I have to sit him down for the next five years, three times a day at the kitchen table before I even take him out, before I even expect him to sit at the big kid's table, right? Now. Does, does that make logic to everybody? The thing is, we don't apply the same logic when it comes to succession planning. Right? Just because your kids have made good personal life decisions does not mean that you as a family can sit down and make decisions together just like that. And a lot of farms, they have a one-time family business meeting when they go to do succession planning. And dad just expects it's going to be like Christmas dinner where we sit and put a pie in the middle of the kitchen table and serve it and expects everybody to talk at the end of the, me at, at the, end of the meeting about warm, fuzzy memories of growing up on the, as, a, as, a, as a child on the farm. You know what that meeting's like? It's like cavemen sitting around the kitchen table. <laughs> and the thing is that everybody anticipates, has expectations about how things are going to go. Everybody comes to that meeting with expectations about how things are going to go. And they're really frustrated and disappointed in family members when they don't have the same expectations. And the root problem is that the family haven't been able to be really good at problem solving together. It's always been father knows best in, that, that, in a lot of those worlds. And we have a situation where it's important to be right instead of it's important for things to be right. It's like cavemen sitting around the kitchen table, everybody looking at the pie. And because cavemen never have learned table manners, everybody's reaching for pie. The only thing they use knives and forks for is, is weapons. And then maybe one of the kids grabs a pie and puts it underneath his arm and is run down the road, and you got a mob scene chasing after him. You guys know neighbors like this? It's a shame when a family, a, a husband and wife spend 30, 40 years of hard work building up an awesome family. In 20 minutes, it's done because they want to be cheap and avoid paying one of those succession planners and uh, just the, ought to be as simple as divvying it out. My only advice to you is this. Until, and this is, this, is, this is the only piece of advice I want you to guys go, go home with. Until you as a family are able to sit down and squeeze out an extra 10% profit, together as a family, not one person being a dictator, but you guys are able to make decisions together, until you guys are able to sit down and make, squeeze out 10% within 10 months, you're not ready to talk about where the farm is going to be in 10 years' time. Okay? So, um, I should just mention, this is my wife Bernadette, and uh, we got books at the back. I wrote a book called Bulletproof Your Farm, and as part of the speaking fee, everybody goes home with a copy. So be sure to go introduce yourself to Bernadette. She's a, she, she makes, um, I don't know about you folks, but we take, I only get off the farm about 10 days a year, right? The rest of the time I'm pretty busy helping a lot of farms all across North America. I work, work from home. And, you know, we, we use this as a va family vacation every time we, um, Huck thinks he's in Disneyland right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the thing is that, uh, Folks always say, well, how did you, if you're up in Canada, how would you meet an American girl? And uh, should I tell them a story, honey? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so the thing is that, uh, um, well, the, th the truth is, 
you only have to go on two dates with two nice girls and for them to turn out to be your cousins to decide to go across into a different country to, to, to date women. <laughs> Farmersonly.com, that's all I can recommend. <laughs> so, so that's how we got to America. Anyway, so, so the, um, just, just before, let's talk about happy and let's try to wrap this up. But I want you guys to tell me, um, let's talk about happy. For the last 12 years, all I've been doing is turn around the most dire either farm debt or farm succession circumstances. Now, I want you guys to tell me about the neighbors, okay? So what do you think would be causing an unhappy situation on a family farm? So we could have jealousy, uh, we could have anger management. What are other problems you guys have heard? On, I mean, I know you guys are talking about the neighbors, right? But what, I mean, I'm picking on you because I can't see your, Mr. White, what's, <laughs> what, Jeff, what, 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 what do we have for, what would be things that you heard the neighbors talk about? Financial matters. Financials? What are other things that cause um, strife in a family? Mr. White, White's son. <laughs> yeah. uh, age differences. And okay. Um, age gap. Okay. What are, uh, James, what's, what's a good, good one? Just making decisions. Making decisions. Okay. I, I'm going to go for 10 here. So, Tony, what do you got? Uh, poor communication. Okay. <clears throat> Mary? Um, do they really want in? Do you want this? Okay. Um, Bob, what do, you, what do you have? Different value systems. Yeah. I think you guys get the idea, right? Does anybody else have, a, like, give me a couple, guys. Let's talk, let's talk about the neighbor situations. Yeah. I'm going to put vices, is that right? Or I'm going to put alcohol. Okay, w come on. Uh, give me a couple more, guys. Entitlement. Entitlement's huge. Huge. If I could spell it. Okay, I think you guys get the idea. So, when I, uh, so I've been doing this over 12 years. And what I used to do was fly, I mean, I was the guy that they called after two or three media years didn't work. So I wrote for a few farm magazines. I was the guy from Canada. I was the last ditch Hail Mary effort, usually dealing with pretty crazy situations. And as a mediator, generally how I used to work and how I was trained and how pretty much everybody else does it is they, they, you sit down in the morning with each family member you talk one-on-one -on -one with each family member. And then in the afternoon, you sit down with the entire family. And you try to sort things out. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah. And so the thing about that is, um, what I come down, down to realize is that I'd have situations where dad would tell me about how his son was, had a short temper, for instance. Right? I don't know, does anybody have any neighbors like that? where they, they have a bit of a short temper. And the thing is that the father was saying, my son has a short temper, and he gave some examples, and it was crazy. And then I talked to the daughter, and then I talked to the son-in-law, and I talked to mom, and you know what they all said in different rooms? Son's just like dad. That's right, that's right. The apple doesn't fall far, far, far from the tree. You know what I also found? Does anybody ever notice any stubborn farmers? I, I mean, is that not a family trait for a lot of, a lot of, a lot of stubborn? No, never, never, right, Bob? <laughs> so the thing is that, that um, what, what, the best way I can liken the situation when we're sitting down with a family in the afternoon, and I hate to get into this, but it's the best example I can think of. Does anybody heard of this guy named uh, Donald Trump? 
Has anybody, has anybody, everybody knows him, but has anybody watched his TV show? Right, The Apprentice, yeah. right? Now, even if you're Amish, you've seen the, the show The Apprentice, right? <laughs> That's why I bring it up. I don't care about his politics or whatever. But the situation, tell me what goes on in this TV show in the, at the boardroom le, a table. Tell me what goes on in that situation. One person makes all the decisions. One person makes all the decisions. What else do we got going on here? He berates everybody and insults them. Berates and insults them. And they're all insulting each, and it's not just one person, it's they're berating and insulting each other, right? What? Then he fires one. Then he fires one at the end. That is what a mediation is. And I hate to say it, the expectation is somebody's going to, even grandma, like it's crazy. I, I sit at, like, the sweetest little old lady that makes the best damn pies. She comes to this meeting loaded for bear, right? She's got all this dirt over the last 20 years she says nothing about. And if anybody starts accusing her, she's going to pull that stuff out and start pointing fingers. And you want to see a family go from being an awesome family to not talking to each other ever. Just have a mediator on your farm. It's scary. The one thing I learned, has anybody... Does anybody believe that the family farm is the best place for a kid to grow up? How many people believe that, that the family farm is the best place? Why? Why do we believe it's the best place for a kid to grow up? Understand the life? What else? Is it? What, uh, why is it a place for kids to grow up? Work ethic? What else? Accountability. Accountability? Responsibility. Responsibility? Independence? What are we teaching 4-H? We teach character and we teach skill development. Is that not right? How many people believe that? Where do we go from that mindset to being at a sit, sitting at a kitchen table saying, I don't need to change, you freaking need to change. Where do we get the mindset, you can't change him? This is what causes farms to fail. We, we stop learning, we stop growing, we stop developing. Does anybody here know what the term actualization means or self-actualization? Does anybody here, somebody has to know. Well, you realize who you are. That's right. And you become a better man every day. You see yourself in the mirror for who you are and you recognize there's opportunities for improvement. And the thing is, the families I, like everybody always thinks, oh, it's the, it's the banjo pick and trailer trash that I'm going out to see. We're talking about $40 million farms, like the, the farms that are the most respected in the community, that you would be shocked to hear what I'm saying. The thing is, these guys are awesome. Each, each of these farms that I've been to, they're, most of the time they're way better men than I'll ever be. And the thing is, every farmer has got 95% good about them. It's just everybody has flaws, right? 5% of flaws. And if we adapt the attitude instead of, instead of, I'm perfect, you need to change, to everybody recognizing, okay, there's something that I need to change, and how do we evolve, you'll have a completely different environment. If you, for that farm, I was running short on time, I had to catch a flight. So what I did with that one family, where there was anger management issues, they had a long list of problems. I said, okay, Let's pick anger management. And so instead of sitting the family down for a three hour um, drama fest, right? I said, okay, there's, let's, let me, let's summarize this. You've got the, and they had, we listed off 12 key issues. We've got them all to rank and prioritize. If I take your family and you guys, as in the back of my book, there's a list of 50 things that commonly happen in every family farm. Now, for every family farm, there's going to be a few unique things. But if you go through a list of 50 things and you identify 10, 12 things that are a problem on your farm, and then you rank and prioritize, if you put five family members in different rooms, 90% of the time you'll all write down the same damn thing. Right? And so instead of accusing each other of problems, what you do is what I do is I come to the table after getting everybody to go through a survey. And through that process, we identify what are the top problems in the farm. And it might be something like anger management. 
And then I say, okay, for the next three months, we're going to pick anger management. Where's that marker? We're going to pick anger management. And we're going to, we're going to talk about entitlement. And we're going to talk about jealousy. And we're going to work on those three flaws that is common within the family. It's a family, family traits that we don't like. And we turn, let's turn them from weaknesses into strengths. So every time, every week, we have a time and place to be able to sit down together. We make one improvement in how you guys work together. And what that is code word for is anger management, for instance. It'd be, what's one incident last week where you sat down, you had some, somebody lost their temper. And then we go through what caused that person to lose their temper. What were, what, how were you guys disorganized? How could you guys done a better job of planning? Um, who was poking the family member with a stick, right? That caused him to be aggravated? And how can we um, also change your perspective? That'd be something we talk about in five minutes as part of that hour meeting. And if you make one improvement every week as to how you guys work together, within three months, if you pick off three vices or uh, three, three areas that causes your family to be unhappy, you do that every, three, every quarter, that's 12 improvements in the course of the year. If a family had these issues, let's just say if a family had these issues, like these 12 issues or whatever there are here, and they were able to fix these problems at least to 80%, you know, there might be a couple of things that they need to work on in year two. How much different of an environment would it be? Would this be a farm that you'd want to work on? Everybody says that economies of scale is a key determining factor whether a farm will, will be successful or not. And I do believe there's some truth to it. Okay? You give me a $40 million farm of assets, doesn't matter if it's a dairy farm or cash crop, but they've got $40 million in assets. And you give me a farm, $5 million in assets. Now, let's assume today that everybody's button heads and pulling the farm in different directions. They might pretend to be perfect the community, but they've got this crap going on behind the barn. If they're able to go from button heads, if they're able to fix these problems over the next year, let's say, uh, let's say the $40 million farm stays the same. They don't want to change. They don't change. And you got the $5 million farm, they go from button heads and pulling the farm in different directions to being able to make decisions and pull in the same direction. If crop prices remain low for the next five years, Who's going to be around in 15 years' time? More importantly, whose family Christmas do you want to be at? Right? How many people believe that this, there's a few ideas here that you want to take home to the farm that you actually want to apply? Okay? Here's, the, here's my challenge to you. How many of these meetings have you gone to in your lifetime that you hear a good speaker, you hear a good concept, and then three weeks later nothing's changing in your farm? And then three years from now, nothing's changed. Is this really a circumstance where you cannot make changes? My challenge to you is to change how you deal with change itself. Okay? And the simple way to do that, when the, when the samurai, they go into battle, they cut themselves. My simple challenge to all of you guys, it's, it costs 25 cents. Go home, spray paint your shop door tonight. It's that simple. If you aren't committed enough to actually spray paint your shop door, you're not gonna hop, this is not gonna happen in three weeks time. It's crazy, but make, make sure that your partner's are on board too, by the way, before you do this. But the thing, is, the thing is that if you spray paint your shop door and you get your cost production down to this number or even close to it, you can easily, you can easily afford to buy a new shop door. If you don't make these changes, my question to you is, in 15 years' time, are you guys actually going to be even owning that shop door? My second piece of advice is this. It's very important. Farmersonly.com. It's the only way to go. <laughs> so, and the third piece of advice is this. It's, it's one sentence about succession planning I don't want you to forget. Anything you can do, I mean, until you as a family are able to sit down and squeeze an extra 10% profit out of your farm with your partners in 10 months. 
you're not ready to have that discussion about who gets what in, in 10 years time. Thanks very much, really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's good to meet you. No, don't worry about it at all. I got, I got, yes. Sure. All right, thank you, Andy, for that. Um, I have to say, I was sitting up here.